Um, I was in a group of 12 of the apprentices, the intake that year. And he said to me, you could do my job. And mm. there was probably six or seven levels between where I was and where he was. Mm -hmm. um, there was um, decades of, prob um, of structural consistency. Mm -hmm. And when I refer to structural consistency, I mean that there's a demographic that would fit every single role and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And those roles and responsibilities did not have people that looked like me <laughs> on my position. So the association between myself and where I was and where he was, there wasn't one. He built that link just by saying something mm -hmm. like, you could do my job. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, what do you mean I could do your job? Why would, <laughs> who, who am I, why would you say that? And he said that, number one, you have the potential. Two, I see you have the aptitude. Just at the moment, you don't have the right um, level of thinking, resilience, consistency. And I can give you that. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Against All Odds. My name is Daniel Koka, and our guest this week is... Um, someone I met at the last UK Black Business Week. He was actually featured as a panelist on there. And I really, really enjoyed um, his, his short, um, basically, uh, presentation that he made. And our guest this week is in the person of Mr. Daniel Michael. I'm not sure if I pronounced it right. It's Michael. 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 Yeah. And Daniel is a, an asset manager one of the UK's biggest uh, telecom companies and he has an amazing story which uh, we're bringing to you today. So Daniel, welcome to the Against All Odds podcast. Hi Daniel, how are you doing? Thank you very much, thank you cool. very much and I'm glad we've managed to, to do this after after a few few months of um, back and forth. We try. <laughs> we've been trying, haven't we? <laughs> so tell me, how does a, a London-born Jamaican with a German sounding name, go from South London to being an asset manager at, at, a, at a huge telecoms company. Before this episode starts, I'd like to ask a big favor. Your subscription means a lot to us because the bigger this platform gets, the bigger the guests get. So do me a favor, please click on the subscribe button and the bell notification so that you don't miss out on any future episodes. Now let's get back to this episode. Um, it happened over, it's, it's a long period of time. So firstly, thank you for inviting us on the podcast. It's, uh, it's been a long time in the making. <laughs> <laughs> it was October when we, we met at the UK Black Business Week and you approached and um, I think following the panel, it was, um, some, it was an opportunity definitely to take up. So for, yeah. firstly, thank you for that. Um, and the, the answer to your question um, is something that's probably a, is a long story mm -hmm. um, through many different paths. Um, to starting off, I mean, my parents are um, Jamaican born, so I'm first generation Black British. Is the Windrush generation or? Um, just after, so my granddad came over on the Windrush. Mm -hmm. um, my granddad was a qualified accountant okay. uh, from Jamaica, and then when he came over, uh, I was talking to, this, I was finding out some background on my family the other day with my mum and my dad um, and on my mum's side, he came, they came, when they came over, being a qualified accountant, the only job you could get was a bus conductor. Wow. So we started off on the buses with London Transport as a, as a conductor. You remember the old days you used to give tickets? Yeah. <laughs> right, so he's a qualified accountant, went round to all of the different firms, mm -hmm. doorstep them, unable to get any kind wow. of employment and that was the state of play back then. Mm. Mm. Um, and then he then went on to be an accountant for um, a, a quite a big firm. I'm, I forget the name, it escapes me, but he, okay. he ended up in his chosen profession. Okay. Um, and my mum and my mum then came over after he then made their initial move. Okay. Okay. Um, so my mum and my dad are both from Jamaica. They came over there when they were in their early, early teens or even before I think six. And then my dad came over slightly later. Um, and then settled in New Cross. My mum is in New Cross uh, at Peckham, and my so my dad was in Peckham, and my mum was in New Cross. Okay. Um, and what happened was, 
you know, me, I was born uh, in uh, what's, what's it, where, um, King's College Hospital. Okay, okay. King's College Hospital okay. in the Dallas. late seventies. Yeah, um, and then yeah, grew up in New Cross. Um, went to school there. Was uh, went to secondary school not too far from there, yeah. and then um, following that, ended up being a um, an apprentice. So did quite well at school. wasn't the well, probably wasn't the most um, consistent. But I was resilient, so okay. I, I went to the London Nautical School, okay. um, which was uh, in Croydon, or that was in Waterloo. Waterloo, okay. Waterloo, okay. so got sent there, um, not, not for not out of choice because I wasn't the <laughs> like boats or the sea, um, but I did learn how to you know learn about um, going into different areas, making new friends, making new connections, and uh, following that, became uh, an apprentice trainee for British Rail Telecoms. Stayed there for a while, um, and then whilst all this was happening, there's things that happen in your personal life, right, that affect mm -hmm. your professional life. Mm -hmm. So I had, I met my my future wife when I was around about um, seventeen, eighteen. Okay, uh, you've met her. I have, I have, yeah, lovely, lovely lady, yeah. And uh, we met at Notting Hill Carnival. Oh wow! Yeah. Okay. So back back in those days, yeah. what used to happen is we would all get together and get on the buses. Mm -hmm. Or the tube and go up to Notting Hill Carnival. A lot like what happens today. Mm -hmm. Walk around, follow the flows, yeah. find someone you like. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, we met there. And all this time, so my sort of running in parallels, my professional life and my personal life. And we ended up, uh, we got together and we had um, a first set of twins. Okay. Our only set of twins, by the way. <laughs> our first, our first. Children, um, when we were twenty, very early in age, oh, wow, okay. and that made a man of me. That was like right. So I, I was a trainee, I was an apprentice, then I was an engineer. But that was right. That's the switch. Okay. And I think um, that that experience is something that um, really triggered the reaction. Mm. So you know, cause and effect. Yeah. That scenario, right? We yeah. now have a family to look after. I'm all about my responsibilities. Mm. Um, and that spurred me on to sort of accelerated. So I went from when I was at British Rail, it became a company called Raycor, so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then Talis, one mm -hmm. of the biggest technology firms, a French company. Um, and I made it for, in about two or three years. I made it up to like um, sort of from engineer level to management level, so then sort of one of the leaders of the management level mm. grades. I seem to remember when we first met that you said that there was a gentleman who had influenced you. Very much so. Yeah, just tell our guests a, bit, a little bit about experience. <clears throat> so um, I think during the panel, the whole one of the um, points of conversation was around about mentoring and mentorship, mm -hmm. um, and the importance in the career of anyone, um, but especially targeted to um, people I identify with, young black males. Um, and I met a guy called Michael Uzi Chukwu, and. He might see this podcast, <laughs> and if he does, thank you, Michael. But this guy was, um, when I was an apprentice, he was literally the head of engineering. And in the early 90s, that wasn't a scenario which was one, commonplace, or two, similar to my experiences. Um, so when I saw him, I immediately identified with him, and he, I think he identified with me being someone that he could see potential in. And the first thing he did was told, tell me, he just told me. So he had no reason to. Um, I was in a group of 12 of the apprentices, the intake that year. And he said to me, you could do my job. And mm. there was probably six or seven levels between where I was and where he was. Mm -hmm. um, there was um, decades of, prob um, of structural consistency. Mm -hmm. And when I refer to structural consistency, I mean that there's a demographic that would fit every single role and responsibility. Mm -hmm. And those roles and responsibilities did not have people that looked like me or my family. So the association between myself and where I was and where he was, there wasn't one. He built that link just by saying something mm -hmm. like, you could do my job. Mm -hmm. So I asked him, what do you mean I could do your job? I would, <laughs> who, who am I? Why would you say that? And he said that, number one, you have the potential. Two, I see you have the aptitude. Just at the moment, you don't have the right um, level of thinking, resilience, consistency. And I can give you that. 
and for, you know that's something I'll be forever grateful for because just those words when you have a mentor and that person's invested in you it's not your manager it's not your boss he doesn't have he doesn't have an objective for you to meet he just wants you to to do well to do well mm -hmm. and when someone invests that amount of trust in you and then you then exchange that trust being a deal maker mm -hmm. with a handshake and yeah. agreement mm -hmm. um i think what happens is it inspires you and then it motivates you mm -hmm. together if you pair that with my parallel personal life where I'm like I now need to make um, ends meet I now need to um, be a provider for my situation my wife my kids um, at an early age then I think what that does is spurs you on mm -hmm. and I get I'm guessing what he saw in me from that moment was passion mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I developed a sense of passion mm -hmm. if you asked me to do something I did it mm -hmm. if I um, made an agreement I honoured it mm -hmm. um, if there was um, it, if there's something I needed to tell you I was honest about it mm -hmm. I told the truth um, and I think that's what uh, Michael Uzi Chukwu did for me because he was someone that at that level the level he was at, he had to have those characteristics because of the mm. relationships that he built with the people that were stakeholders to him. Mm. So. Mm. so, Daniel, uh, my namesake, <laughs> <laughs> just tell me a little bit about your background, just to give us a bit of context to, to your thought processes and the attributes that you've, you feel have probably helped you on this journey. And, um, and one of the things that you've spoken about, which I, I, I can identify with, is your your passion to to deliver because we've had to reschedule the shoots you know because you had a there was a bid that you were working on and that had kind of needed to be get done mm. and, and i could feel your passion through that you know mm. right until the time you said no i've submitted the bid and all that so i don't know if there's something that you developed as you're growing up and what was it like growing up in the miko home you know what made you decide on a career in engineering did you get into an apprenticeship by chance you know you haven't really touched on those points you know mm. and i just want to see how where there was any um intentional um efforts to become an, an engineering apprentice or did it just happen because some people might watching this you know might be in a situation where they're not quite sure where to go mm. and you know I don't, I don't know if there's a thought process that they might pick from your story that could help them. Okay, so um, number one is, at that age, strategy doesn't really come into play. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you're, when you're at school and um, you have a set of options following your exams, the strategy part of it where you go, I need to be here. There are very few people that at that age developed that. Okay. But there are two things that were, um, that were very much the influences in my decision-making progress, right? Process, sorry. One was my mum, <laughs> the second was my dad, okay. right? Um, so my dad was, a, um, was an engineer for um, British Telecom. So when he came over from Jamaica, he then studied and done his studies and became an engineer for British Telecom. So I was always familiar with um, the technical terms, telecommunications, mm -hmm. those things, because he would talk about it, I wouldn't have an understanding. Also, my dad loves music. Okay. So my dad used to have... Um, Pre-amplifiers, amplifiers, speakers, <laughs> records, turntables. My, my, all my dad's friends would come round, and my dad's. My, I'm from Jamaican descent, right? So all my dads would come round, play dominoes, <laughs> do, play music till the early hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. And my mum, also from Jamaican descent as well, she would be someone that's always involved in my um, in my schooling, in what I was doing, how was I doing, how would I prog process and progress. Um, the information that was was given to me at school, so it's it, 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 the the decision making process was, and this is something that I think um, I've tried to do with my children too. Mm -hmm. Is um, I, I would you know I guess we do it with our children, right? Mm -hmm. Is we see an avenue for them, we see something they're good at. We were talking about superpowers earlier, right? Yeah. What's yeah. your superpower? Mm -hmm. But, uh, my granddad used to call me when I was about six or seven because my granddad was didn't have any superpowers in technology. <laughs> right? My granddad was like, "This radio has a battery in it, and mm -hmm. this battery's not working. Daniel, come and fix it." 
Okay. So I would go and do all my granddad, change all his batteries. Mm. Um, mm. If he had things to fix, then he'd say, right, fix that for me. So I would fix it. And mm. I could eat, I could easily, I could break anything, Daniel. <laughs> Literally, you give, you, give me a piece, you give me a toy, I would break the toy and try and put it back, back together. together. Okay. My sister would break my toys on purpose. I'd break hers. But then my dad would say, fix your sister's toys. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I think I've always had, um, I've always looked at things from a component perspective then then said right i could then put these components together and make this mm. uh, and um i think they saw that and then when i finished school my mum said do what do you want to do go to sixth form and um because i was got, i had a i have a, i have a a, a a talent i guess um and I, I, I don't want to call it that but i'd like to call it that a talent for um literature writing literature okay so what you know when we're talking about the bids yeah um, I find it quite easy to tell a story through bit through any kind of bid writing. So mm. if there's, you know, how are we going to enable um, a service as a deployment, as an implementation to you guys, mm -hmm. and you guys are the people that want us to issue the tender, mm -hmm. how are we going to meet your requirements? Mm -hmm. What's your specification? Mm -hmm. I can write about, you know, we start here, we do this, mm -hmm. we do this, we do this, and we end up at the end of the story with a happy ending we, you, know, <laughs> you give us the work and, and you pay us so um i think that that whole engineering part is is almost part of storytelling because mm -hmm. you start with a series of parts you put them together mm -hmm. in the middle you don't know what's going to happen at the end <laughs> and then by the end you have a um something a deliverable that meets a function mm -hmm. and so that's where you know that I guess that will to deliver something mm -hmm. in that meets someone's requirements helps in engineering mm -hmm. seem mm -hmm. to fit mm -hmm. so you, you you come across as somebody who's quite um <clears throat> sort of thoughtful and you kind of think things through because people have different sort of um profiles people you have others who are more feeling mm -hmm. you know, kind of they go more by gut feel but you, you're more of a, a thoughtful methodical you know, analytical person. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but what do you say? I'm, I mean, I think, I think it's spot on. Mm -hmm. um, so we've done uh, d during my the years of training. Um, we did a we did a like a you know one of those psychometric tests. Where okay. You ask you hundred <laughs> questions and they tell you what you are. Um, they definitely said that, you know I'm a, someone that you consider an analyst, um, and that helps in engineering. But I'm also a driver, so. I'm one of those people that go right. Cool. I need. I, I might need you to do something, but you need to do it now. <laughs> and, and the clock's running. And I, you know, like so. Yeah. And I understand. And I think what happens is when part of my role as a asset manager is to manage a set of um, people and people classified as being assets too in terms of a company, and help them to deliver what needs to be done to service whatever kind of uh, contractual obligation that we have mm -hmm. and um, being able to break things down into component level like you mm -hmm. say mm -hmm. um, helps to then go right I can build a roadmap a journey um, of how we're going to get from A to B a okay. bit like it's a bit like Google Maps right? yeah. <laughs> we yeah. go on, we, on the way here we said how are we going to get here mm. um, and we left at a certain time and because we built enough contingency, I could stop yeah. and have a coffee, and, yeah. have a <laughs> and, uh, and here we are. But yeah. uh, to answer your, I guess, to answer your, the, the question that you originally um, asked me was, does that, that those people, my mum and dad, and everyone in my immediate family, I've got a massive support structure. Like okay. my, my aunts, my sister, even though she's, you know, my wife, everyone um, form part of that support structure. And mm -hmm. those people, are the ones that then influence your decision when it comes time to making a decision. Mm. So. so another thing about, and thank you very much for what you just said, but another thing about um, that I see about you and which is why we're featuring you on this, on this podcast is that you've gotten to where you are at your level, not just by technical competence, mm -hmm. but then in the period of time that I've got to know you as well, I've, I've come to realize you've got very good soft skills. Mm -hmm. You're very good people skills. You know, can you just maybe tell our, our our viewers the importance of 
being able to marry up those soft skills with technical competence because you can see somebody who might be technically competent and might be frustrated at their lack of progress mm -hmm. in, the, in the career progression and maybe if such people worked on their soft skills people skills relational skills how to you know how to talk the talk how to read the room how to you know package themselves and all that it might help them to mm. to get ahead in their in their lives agreed agreed um i think there's two there's there's two things right so you're talking about uh technical skills but and communication you can be technically amazing outstanding brilliant you might have the best product you might have the best way of doing something but no one knows about it. <laughs> <laughs> no one knows about it so what problems are you solving how do you then take what you have and the information that you can then pass on or you could sell package um and it become a commodity right mm -hmm. how do you then um Make sure people understand where it is. It's a bit like um, this. We were talking. We, uh, we were talking about this on the way up here. Mm -hmm. But you have, um, in terms of entre being an entrepreneur, right? Mm -hmm. Two types: mm -hmm. one, experienced; two, newbies. Yeah. Entrepreneurs that um, are very new are focused on the box. The mm -hmm. box being the product, mm -hmm. right? Um, I've got the best product in the world. It's mm -hmm. gold. <laughs> it's golden. You must have this product. Yeah. But there's, no one knows about it. Mm -hmm. Then you've got the other entrepreneurs. Those people are the ones that have a distribution network. Mm -hmm. Now, they've got loads of marketplaces. They've got um, numerous locations where they distribution reach a mar reaches a market. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if they sell rubbish, <laughs> but they can sell rubbish everywhere. Yeah, yeah. So in terms of generating um, margin, um, some kind of financial reward, they can amplify that by volume. Whereas the person that's, I'll go back to the original question, mm -hmm. person with the greatest technologi technological solution known to man, does, no one knows about it. Mm. So I think those are the two things is, you can be technically brilliant, um, but you need the communication skills. Mm -hmm. And the communication skills are all about, you can do as much as you want on, on WhatsApp, mm -hmm. but when you know like we're sitting down here and having <laughs> a conversation and yeah. you can you see someone's body language, yeah. you understand that they understand yeah. what you're talking about, You they understand that mm -hmm. you understand what mm -hmm. their problems are, mm -hmm. and you, you build solutions to problems. And mm -hmm. one of our main customers, Transport for London, they have a series of problems, and they'll issue a set of problem statements, mm -hmm. and then they invite all of these um, innovative companies to come in and the the ones that you know solve the problems and communicate that mm. win big contracts mm. and it's the same thing with marketing yourself too you people usually want you to do a job or facilitate something to solve a problem I'm hungry give me some food <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like that I've got the best yeah my wife's got the my wife's got the best jerk chicken out there and now I'm telling everyone who's watching this I, 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 can, I can attest to that <laughs> And um, I need the, we then need to get, whenever you're hungry, that to your table. And then you need to say, do you know what? That was the best done. Thank you very much. And yeah. feed that back. And yeah. that's, the, that's, the, that's the skill. Mm -hmm. That's the soft skill. Mm. So I think that's equally as, um, equally as important. That's, that's very true. Um, one more thing that I, I, I thought I'd bring up is, <clears throat> you know, from starting as an apprentice, you you've progressed by understanding business mm -hmm. you know because i talked to you i mean and I, I can see that you understand business you, mm -hmm. you can see um where the different pieces come together you know, in terms of um having to pitch for business you know having to you know fulfill you know things based on uh, predetermined whatever um contract specifications and whatever it is so you're not just an engineer, but you've actually developed a business brain, mm -hmm. you know, as in for your organization to, 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 to thrive and to, to move on and all that. So you, you need to um, bring in more business, you know, you to fulfill orders, you need to scale, you need to. So my question is, how have you developed that business brain, as it were, from an engineering background? Mm. Uh, I think that um, that is a, <coughs> that is a something that has been developed through 
a lot of pain. <laughs> <laughs> so you, when you're in a when you're in a scenario where there's an opportunity to be one, especially with, um, you know, big, big industries and in, industry leaders where there's a lot of competition, and the competition puts you in a scenario in you know in situations where you have to think outside of the box, and that's based on intelligence and information and how do you get intelligence and information usually by conversation mm -hmm. usually by engaging usually by um working together um in a collaborative manner with the people that have access to that intelligence and then you know write writing the story that goes along with <laughs> that um and, and those things are they're all interlinked they're mm -hmm. all interlinked um and then understanding what it feels like to be on the side on the side of things that aren't so successful mm -hmm. because it's all great when you're you're bidding and you, you know you, what could we do <laughs> and um it's it's great when you've got a customer that's really happy with the service you're providing mm -hmm. but what happens when things aren't so good mm -hmm. what happens when you're losing money mm -hmm. um what decisions have to be made um i've been in in scenarios where we've had people and i've had to terminate their employment and mm. what that means is, is taken lightly, if you're you know, taking away someone's livelihood, um, they can't pay bills, mm -hmm. they can't pay their mortgage, the children might not be able to go to the schooling that they were. Mm -hmm. That's a big responsibility. Mm -hmm. So I do, I understand that responsibility. So I understand that whatever I have to do means that and I don't want to be in those situations and those scenarios. And that, I think that forces you to go, do you know what? How can we do this? How can we increase efficiency? Mm -hmm. How can we reduce cost? How can we improve, in, um, you know, improve output? Mm -hmm. Those are the three scenarios. And once you get that and you understand that, then you, and you start building that to, into models and mm -hmm. how, so you, there's no waste. Mm -hmm. Again, it's something, you know, it's, it's something I've learned over through experiences, both good and bad, mm -hmm. but, um, you know, talking to people, I, we sat and we had that panel, and that panel was almost like a eureka moment because I'd never met Mahari. Okay. So we, when we started working on this, I'd never met Mahari mm -hmm. um, or Rob Wade or. Mm -hmm. yeah, Rob, Rob Wade's coming on this yeah. project show as well. Yeah. Okay. He's a good guy. <laughs> yeah. um, or Eddie Tatuba. I'd, I'd never met any of those people, yeah. and um, we sat and we had. So we were working with the people from the UK about Business Week, um, and we sat and we had a conversation. And me and Mahari, I, 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 I take, I'm, I'm not lying. We, li, we literally, we literally let, looked at each other and went, "Okay, <laughs> we're good, we're good, we're good." And it was, it was one of the, I, 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 like I said, never. But we've had conversations. We were WhatsApping each other. Yeah. You yeah. know, he shared, you know, the things that he's doing in terms of building his brand, like you said, mm -hmm. um, and that all of that for engagement. We sat, we talked, mm -hmm. and it was almost like we knew each other for years. Mm -hmm. And those with that brings intelligence with that brings information mm -hmm. with that brings the availability to improve your network mm -hmm. and support mentoring etc so it's mm -hmm. mixed but you know the whole back good 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 we're, we're we're coming to the end of this interview but before we do um what can you tell us a bit about networking because i i know you you're quite keen on networking with your wife and 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 also her business and all that what can you tell our viewers about why they should network I think that um, I'll talk a bit about my wife's business because it's an opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so with my wife's business, she's um, you know an award-winning um, caterer and she's been doing it for 10 years now. Um, and she has, like I say, one of the, the best products of the market. Um, and what happens, what happens is the networking then opens doors to opportunities for scaling your business Mm -hmm. um, it then generates uh, the the opportunity to have conversations like this is this is fun. Mm -hmm. like this, we, we're here on a, a Saturday morning. It's January, yeah. and this is fun. <laughs> it's great fun, Daniel. It's, it's fun to meet you. Yeah. Um, I wish she was here so we could have the conversation. Yeah. With her. <laughs> I thought she can't be here, but um, I think that the networking part of it is. Um, there's benefits that we'll get from this and it might be a year or two down the line right it might be you know oh, Daniel, I heard about 
this and yeah, yeah. Um, I, I've just started golf um, and uh, I wanted to know what driver to get you tell yeah. me what driver to yeah. get and <laughs> I get a driver um, you know it's it's that whole I think that what happens is, is you start you start off and there's people that I've met through my um, building my network they're my friends mm -hmm. and I don't mean that as um, you know their colleagues or people mm -hmm. that I associate with I mean that um, they're my friends mm -hmm. and you build the, the network enables your um, your friends, your colleagues, your the people that you associate with to understand your brand mm -hmm. and then your brand speaks for yourself and then you become the bearer of my brand. So mm -hmm. someone asked me, oh, have you met Daniel Coco? You're a really nice guy. Mm -hmm. That I am now yeah. someone that carries your brand for you without you having that. To be there. To be there. Yeah. Like, you, you're, uh, uh, the network, that, that my investment in the network is mm -hmm. giving me my return on investment. Yeah, that's true. And that's it's it. passive income, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have to be there, I don't have to do anything, you, yeah. you, you are the person that carries it for yeah. me and I am the person that carries it for you and I think that that's the relationship. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I appreciate the opportunity again. Fantastic. We have a tradition on this podcast where we give our guests the opportunity to dedicate um, their episode to anyone or any group of people of their choice. Mm -hmm. So who would you like to dedicate this episode to? Oh. Easy, <laughs> easy, easy. So first, um, there's uh, my wife uh, and my children, my mum, my dad, my sister, my brother, um, and I think there's a there's a, there's a probably a couple of mentors that I think I should mention. Is one is Michael Uzi Chukwu. If he ever sees this, know you've had an impact. Um, probably, there's a guy called um, Reg Cook, and he's someone that's uh, was once my manager, but then became someone that's um, a champion for me. Um, and those are people that, you know, there's another guy called Farouk Adam. There's quite a few people that have had input into the, my development. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and you too. Ah, thank you very <laughs> much. Anyway, so Daniel, that's been very, very insightful. Um, I'm sure our viewers have learned a lot about how you can go from being an apprentice mm -hmm you know, to being a senior manager and a senior executive in a, in a, in a big company. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you very much for making the time to come to our studio. No worries, and, man. And um, yeah, it's been great. It's been great hanging out with you. Cool. Good, good, good. Ladies and gentlemen, if you've enjoyed this episode, I'd like you to subscribe, um, comment, share, and we'll have some details about Daniel in the section below where you can also find out about a bit more about his wife's business as well and um, i can attest to the fact that she makes amazing jerk chicken so definitely give that a try daniel thank you very much no worries man cool glad we did this cool <laughs> thank you thank you okay